Okay. Just a moment. Okay. So, uh, so my research interest is relevant to non-adiabatic dynamics. So, uh, we I will, we know when the molecular compound is excited by a light, so then the photoabsorption might happen. Uh, on the excited states, the different uh, potential ionic surface might emit to each other. Okay. Just a moment. Okay, so my different electronic state might meet each other and form the uh, potential energy surface crossing. Sometimes it's a kind of conical intersection. In this area, the system may jump from one uh, excited one ele electronic state to another excited state. Uh, both of them are uh, eigenstate of the electronic Hamiltonian. So then in this uh, crossing area, you, you will have this so-called non-adiabatic transition. So the non-adiabatic dynamics is very important in many, many fields. In this morning, we also heard uh, Professor Oleg Prezdo gave an excellent talk on this non-adiabatic dynamics in nano system. But for smaller system, we also say uh, non-adiabatic dynamics widely exist from the ranging from a very, very small system to uh, uh, to the uh, aromatic system in the solution to the transition metal complex. Also for the organic, uh, photovoltaic system and the photoharvesting system, we always can say uh, the trans uh, potential energy surface crossing are everywhere. So this is why the non-adiabatic dynamics is very important for photophysics and photochemistry. So my research interest is highly relevant to <clears throat> this uh, non-adiabatic feature. Uh, so we start from different as aspects of the non-adiabatic dynamics. Today, because of the uh, title of this conference, I will mainly talking about uh, our work on machine learning approach for this non-adiabatic dynamics. So my talk will basically cover uh, different uh, aspects of the machine learning in non-adiabatic dynamics. So the first uh, topic is uh, we want to predict the quantum evolution uh, of non-adiabatic dynamics by using, by using machine learning model. So when we talk about excited state dynamics or non-adiabatic dynamics, we everyone know uh, we have quite a different uh, type of the uh, dynamics approach. Starting from the uh, quantum dynamics, <clears throat> different version of a quantum dynamics. So sometimes we get a very accurate uh, dynamics result, but, but sometimes uh, <clears throat> we have a very large computational cost. Certainly we have this uh, uh, low cost uh, approach to something like trajectory surface hopping or different kinds of mixed quantum classical uh, approach, but somehow the accuracy, it, it is not, uh, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not uh, satisfied. In between we have some other uh, semi-classical approach which are uh, seen same, same between them. So uh, according to such a feature, we will still say today, we still cannot find a, a very good approach to describe the non-adiabatic dynamics with enough accuracy uh, and the low computational cost. Uh, so for this reason, so we will think whether it is possible to do something different. Uh, about a few years ago, uh, Professor Jian Shu Cao in MIT proposed an interesting approach, which is called the transfer tensor approach. Uh, in this transfer tensor uh, approach, uh, say so he basically uh, built a dynamical map. Okay, so it's a kind of dynamical map. This uh, dynamical map will trying to capture the short time dynamics evolution, particularly the uh, dynamical correlation of the whole uh, quantum evolution. So this means basically we can learn uh, if we can build such transfer tensor, this dynamical map by using the short time propagation and then we can, after the, this transfer tensor was built, we can use this tensor to propagate uh, the quantum evolution to arbitrary long time. So this is, this is basically is a kind of so-called autoregression model. So if you go to the financial field, you will say many people use uh, such type of autoregression model to, um, <clears throat> to predict the uh, fluctuation of the stock market in the future, for example. So this, this I, uh, but somehow this is a very interesting point because this really means we can learning uh, from, uh, learning the dynamical feature from the short time propagation and then use the 
same model to predict the long time evolution. So the later they also uh, give us also, Professor Giva also demonstrated this idea work for uh, mixed quantum classical lower equation. Uh, but somehow here still we say this is a kind of the so-called uh, um, linear uh, autoregression model. But if we go to uh, non-linear model, so then we can think maybe we can use so-called machine learning model to build such uh, non-linear mapping uh, model for, uh, for the dynamical propagation. So there's a recent years that uh, many people realized this idea and the different group were trying to um, propose a different machine learning approach to do this, uh, uh, I, uh, to, to learning from the short time dynamics of propagation and then use it for the long time uh, dynamics of propagation. So here are some of the recent work. I mean, among all of these machine learning model, there's a one particular interesting uh, model, which is called the uh, recurrent uh, neural network. So the idea is like the following. Uh, we have the, the uh, uh, different compared to standard neural network. This is a kind of so-called recurrent, uh, recurrent neural network. So the key point is there's a, there is a so-called recurrent layer um, during this. Uh, so he, uh, the layer in this uh, particular node, they will accept, uh, for example, the input at the uh, current time and then give the output. But somehow the output of the current time will become the input of the next time. So, uh, for, so this this means we basically uh, formulate formulate a kind of the um, time dependent progression or time memory for uh, by using this recurrent layer. Uh, but somehow there's a, a lot of discussion about this recurrent neural network. So some people propose to, to, to use a so-called long uh, short-term memory cell to, in this recurrent layer because it gave a very good description about the memory effect. So this basically means by using such type of a particular uh, neural network structure, we can really build a, a kind of the uh, machine learning model who can describe the time series uh, data set very well. So, but somehow there's a different um, uh, issue here because we really want to say, uh, we want to learn short time dynamics. So we want to predict the long time di uh, dynamics, but somehow uh, if we have the uh, long time propagation result, we can easily make a comparison to say, okay, our prediction is trustable or not, or is believable or not. But in many situations, we really don't have this information. We don't have the long time propagation result. So how to uh, make sure our model is reasonable or not? So this, this will um, open another different problem. So now we realize it is possible to solve this problem by using a different perspective. So for example, we can think about the so-called model uncertainty, okay? So, uh, so, so by, if we can really define the model uncertainty, we can really say such type of the uh, confidence of the model, uh, we, can, we can estimate the confidence uh, interval of this model. If this uncertainty uh, increases with time, after some time, we will say, okay, maybe uh, our model is not reliable. So by realizing this point, we're starting to uh, uh, find it is necessary to find a way to uh, mimic the model certainty, therefore we find a, a easy way to do it. This is a so-called bootstrapping resampling method. So the idea is very simple. We are starting from the original training data set. We just create many, many different data set with the same size. Uh, but for the element of the new generated data set, each of the element was taken by the random sampling from the original uh, data set, this so-called bootstrap. Uh, approach. So by using bootstrap distribution, we really uh, create the different uh, <clears throat> distribution of the data set. At the same time, for each data set, we can train an independent model. So now if we collect, uh, collect all of the model at the same time, we finally will result a sample of the model. <clears throat> so then we can uh, make the prediction. This way we are not only uh, give you the average of the model, performance and at the same time, it will also give you the uncertainty of the model performance. So the, now we can really build, uh, use this idea to 
<clears throat> learn the short time dynamics and then predict the longer one. So we uh, take the data from the short time dynamics from the accurate numer numerical accurate multi-layer MCTDH quantum, di quantum dynamics. And then we learn it, build a model, and then we can use this model to make the prediction. But the key point is here, we can we do not only give the um, give the evolution itself, but we also can give you the uncertainty of the model. So this will uh, really uh, tell you whether the prediction of the uh, future event is uh, trustable or not. So for both of the uh, symmetrized spin boson and asymmetrized spin boson model, we can basically more or less get a reasonable result. Okay, so this is uh, this really means the uh, uh, it is possible to use a machine learning model to uh, build the to analyze to, to 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 propagate the quantum dynamics of propagation uh, <clears throat> by using a suitable uh, machine learning model. So now I will go to the second part of my talk. I want I want to talk about analyze of the trajectory propagation in non-adiabatic dynamics. So. Uh, during the non-adiabatic dynamics, uh, several, many people trying to do a uh, mixed quantum classical approach. For example, we are all, ourselves also using the well-known surface hopping approach to um, understand the molecular motion uh, on the excited states. Uh, but somehow, if we go to a large compound, the, uh, so the system become larger and larger. So now, now it's not easier to analyze the uh, active or important uh, molecular motion on the excited state. So there's a one very important issue is how to analyze the important uh, molecular motion on the uh, responsible for the non-adiabatic decay. But then I realized that this is basically a kind of the dimensionality reduction pro uh, uh, idea because suppose we have a very large compound. So the its trajectory represented the point moving on the high dimensional space. If we uh, try to map the, this motion in a low dimensional space, then we can analyze the, everything in the low dimensional space. Then it is easier for us to uh, capture the uh, K molecular motion. Okay, so uh, we, we take, for example, the so-called multi-dimensional scaling approach uh, for this purpose. This idea is very simple. For example, we can always get the, um, uh, for, for example, let, let, let's take this uh, map map as an example. For example, if we know the intercity distance, okay, um, then we can uh, create a map. This is the way how MDS work. Uh, at the same time, during the uh, dynamics of propagation, we can always have a lot of the geometry, a lot of snapshots. Okay, so we can always collect the uh, similarity between different snapshots. And then after we build such metrics, so we can map it uh, to get the uh, uh, to the data distribution in the low dimensional space, uh, but at the same time we also realize that sometimes it is important to use the so-called geodesic distance instead of the Euclidean distance because in the you know, Euclidean distance in the Cartesian coordinate the uh, for example in this particular situation this two point uh, may not be connected by a straight line so for example here from this point to here this is so famous a swiss row picture from here to here is not uh, suitable to describe their distance by using uh cartesian coordinate it is more, much more um, suitable to use the so-called geodesic distance to describe these two points. so it means basically that starting from here the distance to, should be measured uh, by this red line. So here is the same. So for, for example, from here to here, instead of direct uh, connection, you may first jump to here, uh, here, and then go here. So this is a different way to do it. Okay, so we, uh, by using this dimensionality reduction approach, we are trying to simulate the non-adiabatic uh, dynamics uh, evolution for this so-called P5B model. Uh, this is a kind of the bio clock model. Uh, so the center chromophore is something like that. Uh, then if we do the uh, standard multi-dimensional scaling approach, we will say all oh, the trajectory uh, was either go here or go here. So there's a two different uh, pathway uh, for all the uh, snapshot uh, geometry moving. But uh, interesting, uh, this is just, uh, if we really check what's going on here, so we realize that the one branch of the data corresponding to isomerization taking place here, 
The second uh, branch corresponding to the isomerization takes place here. So we have two different uh, isomerization channel, and then we have two diff different dis uh, data distribution. But then if we go to the so-called S map, because then we really do the dimensionality reduction in the um, so-called uh, manifold instead of the standard Cartesian coordinate. So this is why everything will become one dimensional by only using one coordinate, reduce the coordinate, we can monitor the dynamic evolution for this particular system. So here, starting from the middle, this is a Frank Condon area. Uh, if we go left, we got a one channel. If we go to the right, we get a second channel. It's something like that, okay? So by, by doing this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, work, I realized that uh, uh, sometimes the dynamic dimensionality reduction might not always work well because in many situations, we may have several different uh, reaction channels. For example, for this particular uh, system, we have two isomerization channels. Uh, for both of them, we will have the, uh, the trajectory we go forward or backward. We really have different channels. But that really means if we simply take the dimensionality reduction approach uh, to do the uh, to construct the active coordinate, this might not work because uh, at least the different channels should have different uh, active coordinate. To solve this problem, I, I starting to think maybe we have some some more uh, different approach like here. So uh, one day I just uh, uh, by chance find uh, there's a way to describe uh, this problem by by using the so-called uh, measuring the uh, monitoring the so-called trajectory similarity. So this means we have when we have the two trajectory or three trajectory, we can really say, okay, so here maybe uh, the two, tra two trajectory are similar or not. So this means we needed to find a way to define the distance between two different trajectories. So uh, this work was done by a famous mathematician, a French mathematician, it's called a, a free share, okay? So he proposes so-called free share distance to measure the, the the uh, similarity between two different trajectories. So the idea is like the following. So suppose we have two curve, okay? So one curve, uh, uh, let's give, a, give you a very uh, brief introduction about what is this so-called free share distance, okay? Suppose there's a, a one guy who take his dog for walking, okay? So this guy can walk through this A, pass A, and this his dog can follow, walking follow the path, B, okay? So at different time, the man can go to anywhere of, of his past. At the same time, the dog, his dog can also go to anywhere of his past, okay? But there's a different way of walking. So for example, at a particular time, maybe the man go here, maybe his dog will go here. Maybe in a different walking style, he, the man comes here, maybe his dog can, has already been here. So, so here we have to make sure the time ordering remain unchanged, okay? So by using this idea, he, uh, he can really form different walking pattern or different uh, walking style between the man and his dog. So then the shortest uh, uh, length between, uh, length of the rope between the man and his dog define the so-called free share distance. Oh, this is a very abstract uh, uh, definition in mathematics, but in reality, uh, the implementation is quite easier because, because we can do it by using a uh, re recursive approach. So the, the code is very simple, maybe only a few lines which can solve this problem. But, but that, that this will really uh, give us a way to define the two uh, moving objective or, or two pathway, okay? So by, by using this idea, we can really uh, trying to analyze the trajectory similarity. So, so, so for example, here, still for the same system, if we uh, stop the trajectory uh, at half, so we will get class A, cluster A, or cluster B. So there's a two different cluster. Okay, so for each point here, each point represent a trajectory, okay? So this means all of the trajectory here are blue, uh, are very similar, all trajectory here are also very similar. So then after we can separate these two groups of trajectory, for example, we can take this cluster B and then collect the, all the geometries and then do the uh, multi-dimensional scaling analysis of the uh, geometry similarity over all of the, all of the trajectory again, so that we will immediately get such a feature 
So that, that this will definitely give you the uh, reaction correlator with something like that. So this mean, really means we find a way to measure the trajectory similarity instead of all in geometry uh, similarity. By using both of them, we can first uh, define the trajectory similarity. This way we will say, okay, maybe some of the trajectory will go A, some of the trajectory will go B, B channel. So that only for B channel, we can start to uh, do the dimensionality reduction analysis again. So this way, this way really provide us a, a hierarchy way to analyze the trajectory surface hopping result automatically, okay? Uh, but at the same time, because I'm also working in other type of the uh, non adiabatic uh, uh, dynamics approach, uh, so we're also trying to use the uh, dimensional analysis reduction to analyze the, the uh, trajectory result. So here we are using the so-called the Meyer Miller uh, symmetrical uh, quasi classical approach. So this is, a, uh, I will uh, do not talk about too much detail here, uh, but anyway, this kind of the uh, uh, let's say quasi classical approach to analyze or to propagate the non adiabatic dynamics. Okay, so we want to analyze what's going on. So here we select the so called system plus bus model. So, system are two electronic system, and the bus are vibrational mode, which are coupled to these two electronic state. Uh, then we're trying to run the uh, Meyer Miller SQC dynamics, and then trying to use a principal component analysis to understand what's a uh, happening for the bus evolution. But now we get something which is very interesting because here, for example, for this particular figure, we find for the leading uh, component or the primary component of the, uh, during this principle PCA analysis, because uh, the, the leading component means this type of degree of freedom very extremely important. Okay, so for this very important degree of freedom, we always realize that the two types of the uh, vibrational mode are very important. The first uh, group of the vibrational mode, which corresponding to uh, the, they have the frequency close to Rabi frequency. So it means the resonance effect is very important. So the, by the vibrational mode and motion is resonance to electronic transition. So you have the, the this type of mode are very important. Another type of mode are very important is the low frequency mode. I mean, because we are using the bi frequency. So in this area, I mean, the vibrational electrophone and coupling is very large. So this is why they are also very important. So we, we get this, I mean, basically these two observations are, are quite normal for uh, physics because we know resonance is important. Electrophone and coupling is important. But we get this rule uh, without invoking of adding um, physical uh, intuition. We just uh, learn everything by uh, trajectory data. So this is also very, this is also why it's very interesting, okay? So I think because of the time limit, I want to skip the last part of my, my talk. I mean, I, we also did some work um, uh, in potential any surface construction to uh, using kernel regression combined with Ju Nakamura trajectory surface hopping approach to run uh, the surface hopping dynamics. So we get some interesting result. For example, we can use this, uh, uh, surface to run the large scale of the dynamic evolu uh, simulation um, uh, with one thousand trajectory, but with a standard, uh, let's say, uh, electronic structure I, uh, on the fly calculation, this might be a, a really require a lot of computational cost. Okay, so uh, so here I want to summarize my talk. So I, I, I basically uh, working on uh, interesting on three different uh, uh, topic today. So first of all, I want to say the machine learning model can help us to predict the, the quantum evolution. At the same time, we can use a machine learning model and supervise the machine learning model to analyze the trajectory propagation in the non-adiabatic dynamics. Certainly there's an important field, which is the uh, machine learning model for uh, potential energy service and use it to uh, non-adiabatic dynamic simulation. So finally, I want to thank for uh, gave the, my acknowledgement to the uh, all the important people who uh, contributed this work. For example, I want to thank my uh, current group member, particularly Quen Yilin and Jia Wei Peng for their great contribution for all of this topic. And also I want to thank a few of the um, my past group member, for example, uh, Dr. Xie Yu, Hu Deping and Li Xu Song for their important contribution in other machine learning topic. So thanks for my collaborators. Uh, they gave me a lot of the 
support during my start here. Uh, so finally, I want to thanks for the funding support. Thanks, thanks, thank you for your attention.